Um, thanks so much, everybody, for joining us for this Local Community Foundation quarterly webinar. We're trying to do kind of a lunch and learn format each quarter on a different topic. Um, and so we did the first one on kind of how to um, do different pieces of an endowment campaign in conjunction with the LCF Plus incentive program. And then this one is on um, how to ask for a gift as part of a will or a state. Um, so really excited that you guys can spend your lunch hour with us. Um, uh, I feel like a lot of community foundations that I've had the pleasure of working with and talking to over the past um, year and a half that I've been in this position are always kind of dreaming of that really transformational um, legacy or estate gift. Um, and I was just down in Forsyth and we were chatting, chatting with the um, Powder River Community Endowment Fund and they've done a great job of kind of planting seeds with long-term donors about estate gifts and have been really lucky to get some really incredible estate gifts in the past couple of years. Um, so we've been really inspired by their story and I feel like a lot of other community foundations are interested in doing the same, but how to approach donors um, to talk about including a community foundation in your will or estate can be a little bit of an intimidating process, at least for me as a non-fundraiser and I'm sure for many of you on the call today or watching the recording. Um, so I'm excited to turn it over to Jim and Heather um, to kind of demystify this process a little bit and hopefully share some of their experience about how you can talk to a donor about um, including the community foundation in their will or estate plan and just um, make it a little bit less intimidating um, and also share some of the resources that we have with the Montana Community Foundation. Um, a couple of like Zoom housekeeping pieces just before we get started and I turn it over to them. Um, if you guys have questions that pop up throughout the presentation, feel free to put them in the chat. We'll have some time um, for question and answer um, and reading those out at the end, or folks can come off mute and we can just chat about them collectively. Um, and also just ask that you kind of keep yourself mood muted um, throughout the presentation just to help with like reverberations and weird echoes. Um, but again, we'll have um, an opportunity to come off mute at the end and kind of talk a little bit more collaboratively about these pieces. So with that, I'll turn it over um, to Jim and Heather. Awesome. Thank you, Taylor. Um, before I start sharing these beautiful slides, I just wanted to introduce myself and allow Heather to introduce herself. Uh, my name is Jim Bennett. I'm the Gift and Estate Planning Director. Um, I live in Haver. I'm, I'm coming to you live from Haver, Montana. It's about to rain. Um, this time of year, you will find me sneezing quite a bit. So mm -hmm. I'm sorry if I frighten you with a giant sneeze blast, but I'll try to quickly mute myself if that's the case. Um, at the end, we'll have our contact information. If any of this stuff um, is something that you want to visit about one-on-one -on -one with um, any of us, um, please feel free to reach out and um, always glad to talk through things, talk about the weather or whatever. So anyway, um, I will hand it off to Heather. Thanks, Jim. Um, hi, I'm Heather O's and I reside in Pony, Montana. Today it is wet, it is windy, and yesterday our substation blew, so all of this area was without power. So I'm really happy to be back online and with you guys all today. There's so many faces and names I recognized, and, and this is just encouraging because Jim and I love this subject matter, and we're excited that you're interested in learning. Um, and like Jim, I'm a gift and estate officer, so we do identical work just in different parts of this amazingly big state. And we really love those follow-up and one-on-one -on -one conversations. So as we go about today, just be thinking about um, things you may wanna visit with us later and we'd be eager to meet. Awesome, okay, now I'm gonna do the most difficult part of the presentation, which is the sharing of the screen. Okay, I'm doing that one. And... Abracadabra. Here we go. Can you guys see that? How about now? Oops, wrong one, huh? <laughs> I told you this would be hard. OK, can you see the PowerPoint presentation or what's coming through? Yep, it looks good now. Cool, awesome. All right, so uh, here's a beautiful fall scene for you. Um, this is uh, not ever just uh, I'm not sure where it is, um, but beautiful picture. Um, so uh, Heather, go ahead. Sure. Um, you guys, we know this. I mean, it's it's intuitive. We all need a will. 
Um, but I think so many times, and especially Montanans, they, they, they're resistant, um, to, to going through with this. So if you have any of these criteria, you have a child who's still under your care under the age of 18, or maybe you even have a child with special needs. If you or your spouse have children from a previous marriage, you're looking at um, varying assets there, financial accounts or real property, anything tangible. So likely this describes you and many of the people in your community. And one thing I would say, um, when I first started working in this world of gift planning, I was working for the Yellowstone Boys and Girls Ranch Foundation, and my husband and I did not have a will. And we had two small children, very small at the time, three and one. And my boss said to me, if you're going to be credible and you're going to talk about wills to other folks, I would recommend that you do that yourself. And so I would just encourage you, if you don't have a will, this is a really great exercise and it's going to lead to a practical outcome for you. But go through the process. You're going to feel more equipped, more prepared. And again, it gives you more credibility as you're talking with those in your community about giving through their will and estate themselves. And um, just one thing to note here, um, Marsha Getting uh, works with MSU Extension and travels the state talking about this topic of creating a will. And um, MSU Extension has a lot of resources around um, estate planning. And um, Marsha will often say seven out of 10 Montanans die without a will. And so, um, you know, she always says, if you don't have a plan, the state of Montana has one for you. And so um, I'm going to share this over here real quick. Can you see my browser? Um, yeah, so um, MSU Extension has uh, this cool, or I don't know, maybe not cool, interesting tool um, that you can uh, go through the steps um, to uh, determine what happens to your assets when you die if you don't have a will. And so also a really interesting thing to go through if you're trying to kind of understand maybe um, what the current process is. You know, um, we just actually got finished um, working on a scholarship um, that uh, the community foundation will publicize at a later time. But really what happened is um, someone had sold their uh, farm to one of their adult children and he passed away without a will and she re-inherited all of the farm and ranch assets. And so, um, you know, if you don't have a plan for your estate, um, the state of Montana will come up with um, how those assets are going to be divvied up. And so, um, anyway, I'm going to just mute myself for a sec here. Sorry, somebody else is calling. Um, here. Okay, next slide. So with all of that information in mind, you may be thinking, well, who do I consider for an estate gift or a gift through their will? And one of the most obvious but overlooked, and, and in my experience, this has played out numerous times, is those regular annual donors that are giving to your organization or your local community foundation. And by an annual donor, that may be $10. But what we're looking for is that frequency that they're giving year after year. So they're consistently giving to you and they're demonstrating they want to support you. And so it could be a monthly donor that's giving every month, year after year, or it could be one time a year. And so I often, when I'm working with an organization, if they have the capability in their database, I have them sort um, and look at longevity to see which donors have been giving for the longest. And it's not necessarily those that are giving the most in terms of a dollar range. And those are great folks to start with. And then I think another group, as you're doing that as well, is you're going to look at that volunteer group. These are people who self-select, they're speaking up, and they're aligning themselves with your organization and the projects that you're doing. And so volunteers make for a wonderful group to explore estate gifts with. And then the other week, I was listening to kind of some highlights that um, we're seeing in the charitable sector on a national scale. And they say those folks 
who are giving from a donor advised fund. So if you receive checks from a Fidelity, a Vanguard, Montana Community Foundation, Schwab, any of those that say it's a donor advised fund distribution, those folks are twice as likely to have a will. They are just more inclined to have their financial affairs in order. And so they are wonderful people to not only thank for that gift from their donor advised fund, but also then, and we'll talk about it in future slides, have a discussion with them about why, or you could have a discussion with them seeing why they might be poised to leave uh, your community foundation or organization in their will. And then obvious ones are donors without children. Um, you know, they don't have to think about dividing their assets to care for their kids or their grandkids. So that may mean that they have earned more income over their life, because I know with our two kids, I feel like I'm spending money continually on braces and new shoes and everything as they keep growing. Um, but I would also say, don't exclude folks with children either, especially in the world that we're working in now. A lot of families are having the conversation of, I want to leave enough for my child, but not so much to disincentivize him or her from working hard and creating their own legacy. And so there's really a balance. So I think the important thing to keep in mind is look at who's interested, who's come alongside you either in a volunteer volunteer capacity or in a financial capacity or really cares about the work you do and or the community and maybe meet some of these other criteria with a donor advised fund, maybe doesn't have children or has some asset that they have, you know, talked about leaving when they're no longer using that after they're passing. Um, did I miss anything there, Jim? Nope, I think you're good. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a couple of ways that um, folks can give an estate gift. And um, the, one of the first ones that's one of the easiest ones, I think, for people is naming a beneficiary of some kind of financial account. Um, if you uh, have an IRA, an investment portfolio, um, a savings account or a checking account, when you open those accounts, you have to name who the benefiting party would be if you pass away. And um, they're very easy to update. So, you know, if you have a donor that expresses interest, this um, is really nice because it avoids the probate process. Um, the donor doesn't have to update their will or trust document. Um, and they can um, name a percentage of their account or a certain dollar amount if that remains when they pass away. Um, and so, you know, a lot of donors will say, um, well, I have two kids and I'm going to leave 90% of my IRA to them, um, but I could leave 10% to support the community in perpetuity. Um, and so that's a really easy way um, for a donor to make a gift um, outside of their will or trust, but still be considered a, you know, it, it could be a transformational estate gift. Um, also, uh, oftentimes there are gifts of a specific asset. Um, so somebody might say, I'm going to leave you my home or my collection of art or something like that. And that's really great. I think it's important though, that um, you're careful to get from the donor some written confirmation of what their expectation of the, of the gift of that asset is. Like if um, someone is donating a property uh, um, for the use of the community foundation or a nonprofit organization, you know, that's great. Um, but if you are, you know, if you get to that place where you're like, hey, we don't really need another building, um, we're going to sell this. What are the implications of that with the family and within the community? You just want to make sure that the donor is clear about what their expectations of that gift are. If it's art, do they want it to be displayed? Do they want it to be sold and the proceeds to go fund um, the endowment for your organization? Um, it's just really important. Um, I think that you can establish some boundaries there um, with the donor before it gets to a place where they're maybe um, physically or mentally unable to make that determination, you know, and then you're kind of relying on a, a executor or trustee or, you know, extended family or whatever the case may be, 
Um, and um, <clears throat> another uh, potential estate gift is a percentage of their estate residue. So if, um, if a donor is, you know, leaving um, a gift in their will to support your organization, they may say like, you know, Johnny gets the truck and Debbie gets the frying pans and you guys get 20% of the rest of whatever is included in the estate. And hopefully Johnny and Debbie get a little more than that. Um, but, uh, you know, um, there, there are, uh, so basically there are ways that the donor can express their interest in giving. Um, and it's always important to, um, to just know what those things, what those opportunities are, but really if a donor is going to do either the second or third bullet point here, those are things that are going to need to be spelled out in their will. So, um, Thanks, Jim. Mm -hmm. So setting the stage, I think of this really as a getting to know, almost like a dating scenario. Um, these are long-term conversations. I mean, you can imagine already if seven out of 10 folks don't have a will, you can see that it takes people a lot of time to make decisions and commit to things. And so this process, um, while I wish it could happen overnight and we could see all the fruits of our labor, it really is um, a long relationship of of being with your donors. And so part of it is, do you know your donors? And I think a lot of times we think we might know what somebody cares about, or we may think we know which donors may want to leave us an estate or a gift in their estate based on their assets, but we just really don't know. And so I think it's important to spend time one-on-one -on -one. that can be face-to-face it can be over Zoom and it can be phone calls, but really a lot of the uh, nuance of this happens when you're face to face and having opportunities to meet with them consistently. Um, things come up and they change over time and things are revealed throughout the course, just like friendships. We reveal things as we build trust and we build that continuity Um have you talked to them about a larger gift before? You know, maybe there's somebody like I described on those earlier slides that are giving a hundred dollars a year and they've received a thank you letter, but they've never really engaged in a conversation outside of that. And so this gives you an opportunity. Maybe you're starting with um, asking them about a larger commitment for an annual gift. Um, and then besides the money, most folks want there to be assurance, a little bit like Jim said, that their gift is used in a way that they envision it. So it's rare anymore that gifts come for unrestricted needs. And although that's always our greatest need, it seems, most people want a specific program. They want something within the agency or nonprofit they care about, and that's what they want to fund. And so before I even start thinking about the money or asking for that commitment, I really ask a couple of questions about what they're passionate about or how their life has been impacted in a positive way or the change they want to see. And so I'll send these questions to Taylor. I didn't give them over to her, but I can have her send them out. Some of the questions that I use when I talk with donors and families are, okay, I'd like you guys to think about this and as a family or an individual respond. When I think of helping others, I think of supporting, and then this gives them an opportunity. Maybe it's their church, their neighbors, their community, or a specific cause. When I give to others, I hope my gift will, and this is the change or the vision that they're seeing that their gift may be able to make. And then lastly, I ask, our family helps our community in so many ways. Something that I'm most proud of that our family does or that we do is, and then they fill in that blank. Um, this really gets to the heart of why they do what they do, why they love what they love and what they want to ensure. And so when you start to engage in that more, and I'll use the word intimate way, I think that's where you start having conversations about folks willing to invest and leave their money in perpetuity to care about those things. And it does not hurt to role play with somebody. And I think you guys, we learn a lot when we sit down with our, even with a friend and practice this. Um, 
I know there's been things that people have disclosed to me and I'm like, I just never knew you were passionate about that. Where it's something that impacted their mom and dad that has always been a driving force. So role-playing within your family, within your community or your organization can be a really beneficial way to set the stage and get you ready to talk to those donors you've identified and get you ready um, for gym slide. Okay, meeting with your prospect. So um, let's say that you've established that someone might be interested in having a deeper conversation about ways that they could support your organization. And, um, you know, they just want to know more. Um, and you want to know more, too, about what their interests may be. Um, one of the first things that I think is really important is setting the setting. So whenever you're having a conversation with people and you're talking about something that um, could be a, a subject that they maybe don't want everyone to know about, maybe you don't want to meet at the local coffee shop where everyone's going to be. Um, and so maybe that's inviting them to your home or maybe they're going to invite you to theirs. And some people love being seen in public, you know, and so um it's just good to think about um, when you're talking to somebody about a uh, could be sensitive subject, being sensitive to that setting so that they're comfortable, uh, so they feel comfortable talking to you. Um, the next thing, and you know, uh, in the previous slide, Heather said, um, you know, role play with a friend or talk to somebody to kind of practice a little bit. Um, I think that's really important because we all, uh, have like a hundred things bouncing around in our head and my phone's ringing right now, you know, or whatever interrupts your, your train of thought. So you want to, um, when you're, when you're doing that role-playing, when you're doing that preparation, think about, is this someone who, um, you know, you're going to say, well, would you consider a gift in your will or what would you think about? Or, um, you know, what are your desires? Like, Think about who your donor is because some people are no nonsense people and some people are uncomfortable and might need a little more work to unlock. And so um, considering what kind of language you're going to use and practicing that ahead of time. If the donor asks you like, well, I want to leave a car or something, you know, it's like a really fancy 1955 Chevy uh, truck and it's re built and it's a uh, you know seventy thousand dollars is that something that you guys would be willing to accept if you don't know the answer the best thing you can say is you know i don't know but i can sure find out because the last thing that you want to do is agree to something or say something that then you have to go back to that donor and say hey you know i said we could do this but we can't and so um we regularly have conversations with donors where there's a, um, something that catches me off guard or Heather gets caught off guard and we're like, hey, you know what? Um, the best thing that I could tell you is we have a, a group of experts that we work with um, and I can ask one of them and I can get back to you. And that's a really great opportunity to follow up with people afterwards to say, hey, you know, I had a great meeting. I just wanted to let you know Here's what I found out. You know, I heard your concerns. I took notes. Um, you know, I that's something that um, sometimes people are a little uncomfortable if you're going to write down their family history and their deepest, darkest secrets. But if you're taking notes because you want to honor that donor's intent and you let them know, like, hey, I brought a notepad in case you have questions or if there are things that we need to make sure that we're going to take care of, I'd like to be able to write those down. I think that shows your donor that you care about the conversation and you care about the information that they're sharing with you. Um, and so I would encourage you that if you need to take notes, do that because you might walk out of the room and you're, there's like a bunch of emotion and you're like, oh man, I never knew that about that person, but you forgot that you were going to follow up about um, a gift of an IRA or something like that. So um so these are th some um, little uh, tips that I think will help, but every conversation is going to be different and every donor is different. 
And just because someone isn't smiling and rays of sunshine the whole time doesn't mean that they're not appreciative of the time that you've taken to visit with them. And so um, just know that they're not all going to be home runs every time. But every one of these opportunities, you could consider to be a base hit, right? It's moving you forward. And some of these people might take a couple of years to formalize what their plans are going to be because things are moving and shifting and, um, you know, things happen and they change the outlook that donors have. But having a meeting with them and being able to report back to them on things, I think, is um, just one step in a very long process. One thing I just want to comment on setting the stage. Thanks, Jim, for all those slides. I'm 47, and you might not think that I have a hard time hearing, but I do. So he hearing loss, when you're visiting with folks kind of in the age that's talking about wills, if you're in an area which is noisy or loud, some people want to be in a quiet area just because what they're sharing is highly personal and confidential, but then also take into consideration, you know, folks like me and older that may not be able to hear everything you're saying. Um but so after the meeting, right? So like Jim says, after the game, I love your baseball analogy, Jim. And it, it truly is. This is a dynamic encounter. Um, there's lots of parts and pieces moving. And so the first and foremost thing that I think with all meetings is a thank you. It just really demonstrates to them um, that their time spent with you was valuable and that you appreciate them. If at this meeting, they do mention that they are committed, or they may already say, oh gosh, Jim, I've already got, put you in our will a long time ago. Like we love this community foundation. If they ask that it's anonymous, please, 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 please honor that. It's really important, especially in Montana, as you guys know, we are very small. And when we work with donors that want that anonymity, there are a variety of reasons, but the quickest way to turn off that credibility and trust with future donors and even the one who maybe has disclosed this to you is to violate that confidentiality and anonymity. So really, whoever is working you know, with this disclosure and this gift, be conscientious around that. And you know, the game, I guess in Jim's analogy, like the game doesn't end there. It's really important now when you know somebody is considering a gift or they've already disclosed that, it's not over. That's really where you start inviting them to events and they get to witness the impact and be a partner in that work. I think one of the most heartbreaking things for me is when we would get notifications of an estate gift and I would look and I would run to the database and I would realize we had never worked with that person or really hadn't been actively engaged with them because they hadn't told us. Um, so if they tell us that they are giving you permission to invite them and include them in the mission, and it's just such a beautiful um, kind of experience and one you'll get to celebrate even at the grieving of their passing, but you'll get to know that you stewarded them with a lot of respect. And then check in with them annually. They're going to want to give you feedback. And I think that's a good litmus test. They're able to, you know, have two-way dialogue. Um, they're an investor and they're looking for you guys to have a really healthy mission and organization. And that's why they're making that commitment. And then lastly, one of the most compelling and strongest ways to replicate and duplicate your efforts is to ask them if they consider being featured in something. Maybe it's a newsletter or it's a video. It's a simple post on social media. Other folks, or I would say in general, most folks don't think that they are qualified or rich enough or the type of person to make a gift in their will. And it is a very unfortunate myth. So when you can get a person who is, you know, the teacher in your community, maybe it's the banker um, that's been there their whole life to really talk about what they're doing, they can, others can see themselves in that story and they're inspired by it. And that also gives them um, some assurance. And so you'll see kind of this ripple effect when something happens with one estate gift, if they're willing to share that story. Should they not be, again, back to that anonymity, respect that. And then hopefully you'll have somebody else to choose from.
Okay, so um, I was just going to go through a couple of resources that we have on our website. So I'm going to scoot this over here. And um, this is our main uh, landing page for the Montana Community Foundation website. And um, we're currently featuring um, this Keeping Wealth in Montana um, page. Uh, so it talks about the transfer of wealth that's expected from the year 2020 to 2030 in Montana, there's $37 billion in assets that will transfer from one generation to the next. And so um, as a part of that, um, the Montana Community Foundation um, commissioned a study that brings in experts from a variety of fields. And um, they really took a hard look at what assets look like in Montana for Montanans, like for people that this is their primary residence, for assets that can be easily valued. Um, and it doesn't include like, uh, you know, Justin Timberlake's house and Big Sky or anything like that. But um, I love Hill County because that's where I live. So I'm going to select that. But this map is interactive and shows you every county, um, what the estimated net worth is in the year 2020, how much is estimated to transfer in the next 10 years? So, or, you know, from 2020 to 2030, what 5% of that transfer might look like. So if everyone in Hill County that was transferring assets left 5% to support the Hill County Community Foundation, they would be able forever to gift $601,000 back in the community. So um, this is a really cool uh, tool that also has this um, county report. So let's see if it loads up here. I think I'm using all the bandwidth to talk to you guys. Um, okay, so anyway, this could be a really nice um, piece to take if you're going to visit with a donor and you want to leave something for them to look at, you know, um, it breaks down the information about Hill County. It has a nice graphic that shows, you know, if we assume uh, four and a half percent distribution of endowed funds um, and everyone gave 5% of their estate that's tra transferring, what that would do. Um, and then the second page um, has a little more information about, um, you know, what donors can do to take advantage of this opportunity and includes our contact information. So you can, um, you know, find the county um, that you think is most applicable for this meeting with the donor. Um, we've had a few uh, donors that live somewhere where they're on the edge of many counties. And um, I brought some to a presentation that I did for the Lakeside Community Club where my mom is a member. And I brought some for Flathead and for Lake County because um, they have people in uh, Lake County that come to that meeting too. So if you're, um, if you're wanting um, some of these printed out, I think um, it's a really helpful tool to give to people that are considering estate planning gifts. Um, and that PDF is easily printable. Um, the next thing that I would share, um, we have a planned giving website that's um, attached to our website, and um, the link is in this presentation that we'll share with you, um, but there's some sample bequest language. So if a donor um, says, you know, I'd like some information about um, how I can uh, speci specifically put a dollar amount in my will or something like that, um, you can share this sample bequest language with them. Um, and uh, the last thing I would say is, you know, you're not alone. Um, if you want to uh, role play, if you want to ask questions, if you have someone that wants to know more information and you think you're in over your skis, um, you can go to our website and all of our philanthropy staff is here with their contact information and their picture and information about which counties they um, work in. If you, if you don't like me and you wanna to talk to Allie, you can just give her a call. Um, she's wonderful to talk to. And, um, and anybody on our team can help 
get you pointed in the right direction. Also, if you have questions, I'm sure Taylor would be glad to visit with you as well. Um, and so uh, those are just some resources that are on our website. Um, you know, obviously there's a ton of stuff on the internet about this. Pretty much every um, college or university foundation has information like this and a lot of community foundations across the country do too. If your organization is thinking about um, putting some of this information on your website, um, you know, I would encourage you to do a little fact finding and then um, make sure that what you're posting is applicable to the state of Montana because every state has different um, rules and regulations for uh, what the probate process looks like and things like that. So um, if you have questions about any of this, um, you know, again, reach out to us and we'd be glad to help. Um, oh, look, here's all of us again. Um, so this is our, our whole team. Um, and uh, again, also Taylor provides an incredible support role for local community foundations. Um, so I think that gets us to the question um, part of our presentation. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Jim and Heather. Yeah, that was great information. Um, I'm curious from any folks, if you have questions um, that come to mind for you, feel free to just come off mute and we can have a little bit more of like an interactive discussion. I'm curious, Taylor, is there anyone on the call that's received a, a state gift? Anyone? Oh, there's so much opportunity. <laughs> I have one question that I'll plant and then hopefully that'll give um, folks a, a chance to think about if they have any questions, but just curious um, for uh, any of our philanthropy staff that's on the call. So Sarah, um, Heather, Allie, Jim, like what is the balance for you guys between like being proactive and kind of finding those donors that you think might be interested in an estate gift versus like reactive, like um, someone mentions in passing um, wanting to include a community foundation in their estate. Like if it was you sitting down to kind of think through the next year um, as a community foundation, like would you be kind of like trying to suss those people out or kind of wait for those kind of leads to come to you? And how do you think about that balance between the two? Um, I'm going to give you a couple of thoughts and I know Heather has some too. Um, but uh, one thing that I think is really important and maybe sometimes we forget about um, uh, when we're, you know, like doing active fundraising is do people in the community know about this opportunity to be able to leave money that has such a local impact? And um, and I would say, sadly, the answer is most people don't know. And so there's a lot of ways that you can reach out to people to let them know about it. Um, and that can include sending, you know, educational information to your donors. But um, I think there's also an opportunity to visit with people that are professional advisors in your community. So if that's uh, an attorney or an accountant or a financial advisor, or even people that work um, like at a bank that are talking to their clients on a regular basis, um, having something that you can give to them that they can keep in their desk, you know, that says, if you'd like something like along the lines of, if you'd like to keep your money locally, there's an opportunity for you. Um, I think that, you know, the, the thing that Heather mentioned about those donors that are willing to say that they have made an estate gift um, can have a really big impact. And um, I uh, formerly worked um, for a university foundation and um, we had a donor that was willing to include a story about himself um, leaving a portion of his estate to support that um, foundation after his passing. And uh, this person had been a student there and was also the registrar and just knew a lot of people that were alumni of that organization. And so by being featured, a lot of people were like, oh man, that guy's doing something. I love that guy. And so, um, 
you know, I, I think that there's a lot of opportunity to get the word out. And um, the more that you can do that, radio, newspaper, uh, social media is helpful, but also connecting with those people that are the ones that are talking to clients about this on a regular basis and just letting them know that this exists, that this opportunity is out there, I think is really, um, it's a good idea for any, for any kind of um, fundraising prospecting is to find those people that you think would be having conversations with their clients about it. I will say that's tougher in rural Montana where, you know, there are communities where there's not an attorney or an accountant or a financial advisor. Um, but one thing that can be helpful is you and your board just brainstorming, like who, who's your financial advisor? Who's your attorney? And can we individually go to those people and say, hey, I'm a board member for this organization. I really care about what they're doing in the community. If you have other clients that you think might be interested, can I just like give you something that maybe you can give to them? And that doesn't violate the confidentiality between that advisor and their client. So um, I think those are really good opportunities. But as far as like proactive versus reactive, I mean, you can be as proactive as you want and there's still going to be somebody that secretly leaves a million dollars in their will, right? Um, and we all hope for that opportunity. Um, but I think the more that you can get out and say, the reason that we want to make these connections is that we want to honor your legacy um, can be really helpful for people in understanding why it is that they'd want to communicate with you on the front end about a gift as opposed to surprising you with one after they pass away. Heather Oates. Jen Bennett, thank you. Those are some really tremendous ideas. I I would say I, I've always taken a balanced approach um, and I would go back to running a list in your database if you can to start with um, potentially are some people in there that may have the desire to leave a, a state gift. Um, and I would say with all things, be curious, right? Um, we think we know um, but go into every conversation, every opportunity, just willing to learn and to ask questions and really lean into things. And you may be surprised because I think when we intently listen and we curiously ask, people feel that and then they're going to share more. Um, and then lastly, I've had two recent experiences that I thought were fairly unique. Um, Eagle Mount of Bozeman hosted a education and elevate evening where I came and talked about the Montana endowment tax credit, but then they also had an estate attorney talk about tax wise ways to give, um, through your will and estate. And, uh, it's, it's not that it's heavy. It's, it's just a lot of, you know, technical information, but the people that showed up at that conversation demonstrated they're interested and they're thinking about their will and they're thinking about giving. And so then it was up to Eagle Mount staff to really have those conversations with those in attendance afterwards. And it was also fun. I think the Eagle Mount group got to see who was there and they felt some camaraderie and community amongst themselves thinking about. Um, and they're like, oh, you really care this much? I care this much. We all like. And I think it gave um, a lot of encouragement to the staff that work at Eagle Mount. And then I've had other experiences where somebody who has designated a portion of their estate for the benefit of an organization has hosted like a little, um, you know, maybe it's a wine night or it's a, it's a lunch at their house. So it's a much more intimate and smaller and they invite a group of friends who share the same value system and they will talk. They really lead the conversation about this is what I've chosen to do or my family's chosen to do. And then there's a representative there and they just say, you know, would you consider, would you think about joining my family to do this for our community? And so that comes across, I guess, much more grassroots and, and it comes from the community versus sometimes I know as staff, we feel like I don't want to make that ask or they're uncomfortable, but it's peer to peer, which can be really effective and it can be really fun. And sometimes those conversations are like, well, I can't do the estate because like my kids will riot, but here I want to leave a gift right now 
um, for a matching campaign, or I want to do something when I'm living or, or vice versa. So, um, and that kind of spearheads in a real small nucleus of folks that come together. And the energy around that is by somebody who's already spoken up. And so that person also feels a lot of um, love and affinity for your organization when they get to work alongside to help bring others. So those are the, the only nuggets I would add, um, Taylor. I love that. Yeah, those are really helpful. Um, when we were chatting with Powder River Community Endowment Fund, at the end of each year, they do like a little newsletter and they just send it to like 10 or 15 folks, in addition to their like normal donors and supporters that they know, um, like have maybe moved out of the area and might be interested in kind of staying up to date and yeah, just planting some of those random seeds. So I feel like there is, yeah, so many different interesting ways where you can kind of have fun with it too, whether it's a wine night or just kind of like sending a couple of newsletters off into the wind and hoping that those seeds might be planted for many, many years to come. But curious, yeah, Heather. Taylor, just one quick thing. I just thought of this. I think you were in the, on this conversation with me. Um, the, the Stillwater Community Foundation in Columbus, they were putting things like little small ads in their weekly newspaper or what have you talking about a campaign, like an endowment campaign, I think, Taylor. And interestingly, somebody that had moved away still subscribed to that local paper. They really wanted to know what was going on in their community. And they had, I think, maybe grandchildren there or something. And an estate gift, a pretty significant one, came as a result of it. And I'm not saying that's tried and true, but a lot of folks, if they're not living in your communities anymore, which we've seen, people are like matriculating everywhere, they still may be watching hometown news, reading those papers, seeing what's going on. And so it doesn't hurt from time to time to see if you can get your news in there and or take out a targeted ad specific to that. And I know there's budgetary constraints, but again, not everybody who loves your community or your cause will still be in your radius. So sometimes that net has to go a little wider to get that marketing to them. Sorry to interrupt there, Taylor. No, that's a great point. Um, I'll just pause there to see if anybody else had questions that popped up for them. Peggy. I don't have a question, but I have a, a comment. Um, my husband and I are involved in Lions. Jim Bennett knows that. And Mike works with their foundation, the Lions Club International Foundation, which is this huge organization worldwide. And at the last meeting he went to in Chicago, I got this phone call and he says, so he says, I'm filling out this form and I'm going to do X amount of money out of our will. And I went, what? I mean, like, wait a minute, you know, but we chatted for a little while because I had to get caught up to where he was at. And like he said, you know, our kids are grown. They've become, um, I mean, all of them, all two of them, but the, the family as a whole, both, both families make more money than Mike and I ever dreamed of. I seriously, um, they're doing well. My, my younger son-in-law actually owns an airplane and they fly around. And so, and, you know, they have, you know, memberships to Disney and all kinds of stuff. And so, like he said, what do they care? They're not going to move to Sunburst. They don't care about the house. All that's going to happen is we're going to liquidate whatever value there is. Why not give it to things that we are interested in? And it does involve, you know, rewriting the will, which is step one, which we haven't accomplished yet, but I know Jim can help with that. Um, so he said, and why don't you do the same thing for the community foundation? So our conversation had more to do with me getting over the fact that, well, of course, you're going to give everything to your kids, right? Um, I mean, that's just the natural thing. And, and maybe in our community where, you know, the kids are no longer involved in the farm or the kids have gone off and, and, and created their own lives someplace else. Not that you don't want them to have something um, or maybe you go past them and do it to the grandkids or whatever. But I found that pretty easy, a, a pretty easy pill to swallow, if you want to call it that. When I realized what he was talking about was they don't need it. Who does? Who could we benefit? How many people could we touch by taking that money and giving it to um, organizations that, and, and we want to be in our community, but as part of Lions International, we can help people we don't know, but who have needs that we can't even imagine. Um, we don't live in a third world country. We don't live where, um, you know, there's famine and those kinds of things. So 
that's just what I wanted to say. And, and uh, you know, um, I pulled out that document because we got a letter thanking us for I can't even think of <laughs> can't even think of what it's called whatever whatever Lions Club International Foundation does and we got to oh th oh legacy thank you for your legacy and so um, I think that I think that that's maybe a different way that we can approach some of the people in our community who have you know you've always thought it's just going to go to the kids and the kids come back and go well I want that farm like I want a hole in my head um, so anyway just wanted to pass on my own experience so far. That's awesome, Peggy. And I um, I just visited with somebody yesterday that um, doesn't live in eastern Montana anymore, but her family homesteaded there in 1913. And so she was curious if she left some kind of a gift in her will, could it be recognized to remember the family? And um, yeah, I mean, you know, if you're, if, if someone's wanting to make a gift and they want it to, um, be enshrined forever in this endowment that's going to support that county forever, then um, of course we can do things that will honor that family name. And I think that for a lot of people, that's something that's important to them is, you know, my kids don't live there anymore. Um, I don't live there anymore, but that place has a special place in my heart and our family's history. So um, that, um, the Montana Community Foundation has a legacy society for donors that are interested in participating in it. And um, I know Greater Polson Community Foundation has created their own legacy society. So they have their own way of recognizing people locally. And um, that can be a really nice opportunity um, as a way of recognizing those people that maybe have already made an estate gift and also those that are alive, but are going to make an estate gift when they pass away. So um, awesome. Yeah, that's a great reflection. I'm so glad that you shared it, Peggy, and um, uh, helpful, Jim, to kind of call out our legacy society. So, right, like any donor that you guys are working with that are including your endowment um, or your community foundation's endowment that's at the Montana Community Foundation would be a part of our legacy society. So if that's like an extra kind of plus or a nice acknowledgement that you think your donors would be interested in, um, please let us know because we would love to include them in the legacy society. And if anybody's interested in kind of more information, for example, on how Greater Polson Community Foundation kind of started their local legacy society to give a more local call out to their donors that are including the Greater Polson Community Foundation in their will or estate plans, um, let us know. I'm sure that they would be willing to do kind of a similar quarterly LCF webinar where we um, did a deep dive into that. And then we also have an expert on our staff, Kathy Cooney, who's done a lot of work and research on best practices around um, launching a legacy society. So we could do a deep dive on that front. Taylor. Yeah. I had, I also had a follow-up to Peggy's story. Thanks for sharing Peggy. Um, I'm Allie. I'm the gift and estate planning officer in Missoula. And Peggy said something that made me think about something. Um, once you execute your will, so you go to your attorney and you say, I want to leave 10% to, let's say, our family foundation that's held at the Montana Community Foundation. Um, any changes, like you can execute your will and then you can make changes with us, like with your family foundation. So you have a like a donor advised fund with the Montana Community Foundation. And then it says upon your passing, you want the proceeds to be distributed amongst however many nonprofits. And during your lifetime, if you want to change that, you don't have to change your will. You change the fund agreement with the Montana Community Foundation. So you don't incur that additional expense of changing. Um, you, don't, you don't have to change the will, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's so helpful, Allie. Um, Emily also put some helpful thoughts in the comment. She said, um, I think it's also helpful to share with potential estate donors that some types of gifts are troublesome or less valuable to leave to your children than they are to leave to a nonprofit. Um, she said retirement accounts in particular fall into this group, I believe, assuming I'm remembering correctly, that they can be cumbersome tax-wise and timing-wise. So a great point to um, pop in there. Any other questions or general thoughts from the group? OK. 
Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us for this um, hour together. Um, as we mentioned, we'll um, send out the recording afterwards and we'll also put it on the local community foundation um, website under the LCS Plus toolkit. Um, so if you would like to share it with any other board members or um, any other folks in your community, feel free to do so. Um, we'll also send out the slides and all of the resources that Jim and Heather referenced throughout. Um, but just a massive thank you for popping in to join us today. Um, yeah, Emily added that it's motivational. Hopefully it feels like you're not having these conversations alone. If you're ever wanting to brainstorm um, or practice these conversations, I'm here as a resource. Um, Allie, Jim, Heather, Sarah are here as resources. Um, and hopefully it feels like you've got this collective group of other community foundations and nonprofits across the state that are trying to cultivate this kind of culture of giving that I think Peggy spoke to so nicely. So um, anything else, Jim, Heather, that you guys want to say? Okay. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, thank you. Have thank a nice you, everyone. Time.